I was invited today to talk about computational musicology, and if you're like most people who talk to me about computational musicology, your first question is probably, what is it? Uh, and really, the, the glib answer to that question is it's musicology that uses computers. Uh, but I'm going to try to give you a more sophisticated answer to that question. The history of, of the techniques we'd use in computational musicology today actually go back long before the advent of computers. You see, even in the late 19th century, there's some really interesting German studies of the music of Tunisia that are based on counting up different intervals and notes and melodies and trying to do uh, what was state-of-the-art statistics for the time, all done by hand. But these are techniques that we're still using today on a much larger scale uh, and, uh, and with statistics that have become obviously since the late 19th century, somewhat more sophisticated. Uh, it really took off starting with the man I have featured here, uh, Professor Arthur Mendel, who is a musicologist at Princeton University in the States in the 1960s. And the first major computational musicology project was a project that encoded the complete masses of everybody's favorite Franco-Flemish composer, Josquin, uh, coded them in on old IBM punch cards, and again, tried to do the same kinds of things that the German musicologists were trying to do on Tunisian music in the 19th century, count up intervals, count up different notes in the melody, using statistics that were somewhat more advanced in the 1960s to try to identify something about the style of Josquin and the inevitable questions about what he wrote and what he didn't. Uh, it is a very interesting archival disaster that all of those punch cards or the years of work of many graduate students at Princeton in the 60s ended up being used as doorstops and now have been completely lost. And so sadly, that was, uh, that was a form of data that, is, uh, that wasn't as robust as you would have thought that the physical punch cards would have been. Nowadays, computational musicology is not based on punch cards, but it's based on four primary types of data. So the first would be musical scores, musical scores old and new. Sometimes they come to us in the form of a digital image like you have on the screen, and you have to go through a process that we call optical music recognition, and it's the analog to optical character recognition. Can I move from the image that I have before you to some kind of digital representation that includes the different musical symbols on this page? And you can do that just as well for older musical notations like the one I have pictured and the so-called common music notation that classical musicians at least are more familiar with today. We often look at audio, and I'm not going to speak further about that because we already heard such a lovely presentation about that, but that would be source number two. Source number three, already hinted at before, also are metadata, so a kind of classic tag cloud. These are the tags from users of Last FM on uh, Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven. And so you can crowdsource data, find uh, metadata that is perhaps less curated than what you'd see in a library or traditional archive, or you can use the curated metadata when you can get it, although we've heard about the problems of that in the previous presentation as well. And then our fourth source, of course, the data from perceptual and cognitive experiments. So you can hook people up to an EEG machine and see what happens to them while they're listening to music. Now, the most interesting computation in musicology, kind of the ideal, although there are many interesting projects that don't do this, try to blend multiple sources together to try to tell us something about music and to try to tell us about a collection that's larger than what you could realistically hope to listen to just on your own. That's the benefit, of course, of using computers. And so to give you a sense of how you could blend different sources, I'm gonna focus on one example, an experiment that my research group did that we called hooked on music, and it was an online experiment, so we were on one hand trying to get perceptual data, but not hooking people up to an EEG machine, but actually asking them to play an online sort of name that tune game. And the way this game worked is that you would hear a fragment of a piece of music, in this case, not archival material. We were using popular music uh, from the Dutch charts or the British charts from the 
the 1940s to the present. And you're given a fragment to the piece of music, asked whether you recognize it. If you say yes, in order to prove it, what happens is that the sound disappears. It mutes for four seconds. You have to follow along in your head. And then after the pause, the music comes back up sometimes in the right place, so exactly four seconds after you guessed, sometimes in the wrong place, just a little offset. If you were following along well in your head, you should know, yes, this is the right place or the wrong place, and prove that you really knew the music. I'm going to give you a very short example. You can't choose yourself, of course, when the music will drop out, but some music will play from a very memorable tune, then the sound will disappear for four seconds, if you know it, don't shout it out. Just follow along in your heads. And then when the music comes back, we'll take a poll. Who thinks it came in the right place? Who the wrong? Did the experiment. In the interest of time, I'll just move on. Uh, we were able to control for all sorts of differences in people's behavior to identify what are the most memorable songs. And uh, the number one most popular song of all time turns out to be, sadly, uh, Wannabe from the Spice Girls. So specifically, if my audio is working, uh, this portion of it. You wanna be my lover? You get with my friends. Make it last forever. So one of the most recognizable songs of all time, people were able to recognize it in just 2.29 seconds. Um, but how do you turn what was originally a cognitive experiment like that into a computational musicology experiment? Well, what we did is we looked at all of the fragments of music that we used, and first we extracted audio features of the sort we just heard about in the previous presentation. In particular, an estimate from the audio. The trouble with audio is that it's so difficult to work with, but an estimate, the best we could get from audio, of what was the melody, an estimate as best we could get from the audio, of what was the harmony, what are the actual chords playing at each time. Uh, a simple measure of loudness, because for popular music, so often you hear speak of the loudness wars. And then some computational measures of what is the overall sound of the song? Then we combined that uh, with some what in MIR speak would be symbolic transcriptions, but basically digital scores of this music. And there we looked at an exact version of the melody, an exact version of the bass line. And then we also tried to line up these digital scores with our audio files. It's a surprisingly difficult task, although getting toward being a solved task now, uh, thanks to a lot of research that happens right around the corner here in Paris, in fact. Uh, and so we could combine what are the features from the actual musical score and the features from our audio and our sort of crowdsourced cognitive data we had from the original experiment. Finally, a PhD student and our research team, Jan van Ballen, um, extended some tools from text analysis that had then been extended to music analysis to look not only at our raw features from our audio files and from our scores, but also looked at are the values of these features typical within a song? And are they typical within our entire corpus? So in our case, pop music, but you could use any collection of audio that you're interested in. Is this characteristic of Tunisian music? Is this characteristic of the collection at the Bibliothèque Nationale? Once we had all of that, our question was, what can you do to find a hook? Is there such a thing as a recipe? Looking at all of these features, can you predict from the music alone how easy it's going to be to recognize? And the answer is, yes, you can. And the even more surprising answer is that it's all about the melody. We looked at all of these different features. I mean, I've given you just a summary of the categories of features. And when you run it through a statistical model, once you include your melody features, almost everything else disappears. And specifically, to give you a sense of our results, what do you find? You find if you want a melody to be memorable, so if you want to pick out something in your archival collection that people aren't going to forget, first off, you need your melody to be repetitive. Uh, and so an example of what our audio features would say is a repetitive melody would be this one.
So audio features don't always do what you want them to do when you're engineering them, but I hope you'll agree with me there that it was able to identify a repetitive melody. Uh, and, uh, on the other extreme, what was the least repetitive melody in our corpus? And remember, we're talking about melody, not harmony here. Listen to this. So it's a jazz solo. Harmony is very repetitive, as you'd expect for the, under uh, for the underlying musical context, but the melody is improvised and not repetitive at all. All right, second most important feature, prominent vocals. Prominent vocal with no distractions, so even for pop music, more prominent than usual. For example, Alicia Keys. You and me together, through the days and nights. I don't worry, cause everything's gonna be all right. People keep talking, they can say what they like. But for all the challenges working with audio, can you also find examples there where the vocal is not prominent? We did. So there is a vocal there, but you can barely hear it. All right, what was the third feature that makes for the third aspect of the music that made it very easy for people to remember? Conventional melodic material. So specifically looking at every two, three, four note pattern, is it something that's typical of this corpus of pop music in general? What's a really conventional sounding melody? Simon and Garfunkel. The strings I want to as opposed to something like this. Now, bear in mind, you're looking at a corpus entirely of 20th century Western popular music, things that really were at the top of the chart. So nothing is going to be too unusual, but if you're a singer yourself, imagine how you'd feel if the composer handed you this one. So on one hand, it doesn't sound so strange, but it's kind of leaping all over the place. It doesn't have much of a direction. It isn't typical of your pop melody. And then finally, a conventional melodic range, not just melodic material, but you don't want it to go too high and too low in the same melody. Conventional melodic range is hard to hear because it just sounds normal, like Bon Jovi. But an unconventional melodic range stands out like a sore thumb. So I think we can agree if all pop music had a melodic range that small, we would have stopped listening a long time ago. Uh, so in the end, to summarize, you know, computational musicology, what is it? It's an attempt to blend multiple music sources together, ideally over a larger collection of music than you could manage on your own, trying to combine perceptual or cognitive material, trying to combine crowdsourced metadata, trying to combine audio materials, trying to combine digital or even physical representations of scores to tell us something about music that we didn't already know before. Now, what can a project like Europeana Sounds do to help computational musicology? Well, computational musicology above all is data-driven musicology. So what do we really need? Data data, data, and we've already heard a very depressing conversation about this earlier today, but not only data, but the right to use it. Uh, so I think European Assange, however, is very well positioned uh, to provide data and all the different sorts uh, that, uh, that we need to do good computational musicological research, and I hope you'll have good questions about it um, after the next talk. Thank you very much.